With respect to the event to which the honorable member refers, I was briefed the next day that a death had taken place. It was not until Kim Campbell was Minister of Defense when the murder of Shadena Roan occurred in March 1993. In June of that year, she became Prime Minister of Canada until defeated in a Liberal Party landslide four months later. With the election victory, the Liberal Party inherited the Somalia issue. An order in council establishing the commission of inquiry into the, the Somalia inquiry, an investigation purposefully independent of both military and government, was launched by Liberal Defence Minister David Colonnette in March 1995. In the two years before the inquiry, the military had been embarrassed by evidence of bizarre hazing rituals within the Canadian Airborne Regiment. Guard Private Kyle Brown had been dishonorably discharged and given a five-year sentence. Master Corporal Clayton Matchy, brain damaged by a suspected suicide attempt two days after the death of Shadena Roan, was deemed unfit to stand trial. The inquiry was designed to dig beneath the murder itself, to explore the military and civilian chains of command responsible for the entire mission and their attempts to cover up first the murder and then the cover-up itself. Peter Deborah was appointed a commissioner of the inquiry with Justices Robert Rutherford and Gilles Letourneau. I think it was one of those situations where uh, the government is faced with something that's, uh, that's very hot. You can't cover this up. You, it's not going to just go away. You have to do something about it. And while an inquiry may, uh, may cause you problems, at least it'll calm things down for a period of time and allow you to collect your, your wits and, 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 and deal with it later on. Uh, had they been much more aggressive in uh, taking action and dealing with the individuals and firing a few people and putting people in jail and court-martialing them on scene, then the people of Canada would have understood A, something happened, B, something was done about it, uh, thank God it won't happen again. As heinous as the, as the uh, acts were, it was the way we handled them that showed us to be completely amateurish. First of all, rule number one, we should have fired the commander. He's now currently in Brussels, drinking white wine, drawing a great income, working with NATO countries, uh, ingratiating himself. In the old army, he would have been fired. Before we went after the private and put him in jail, before we went after the major, the higher commander should pay the price. It's his command. So it's a harsh rule, but it was an old army rule in the Canadian Army, and it was a good one. And there, but for the grace of God, go a number of us. When we talk very loosely about, well, this has all happened because somehow or rather the armed forces didn't reflect the, the wonderful values of Canadian society, that's a lot of academic claptrap. The armed forces know exactly the difference between right and wrong, and so do, so do the officers and soldiers. And, and to pretend that they don't is nonsense. What happened is that through a breakdown in, in discipline and self-discipline and failures in the chain of command, those fundamental tenets that make the armed forces uh, something honorable, something patriotic, something effective, and something of which we could be proud, got shelved, they got forgotten, they got put aside. We decided that we were going to do this chronologically, basically. We were going to start with the beginnings of problems in Somalia, the beginnings of Canadian involvement, the selection of the Airborne Regiment, the previous problems that the Airborne Regiment had had, how these problems still existed in 1995 and how they were being dealt with, uh, go through the whole training process, the dispatch of the regiment to Somalia, the experience in Somalia, the allegations of cover-up after they came back from Somalia, that seemed to us and to the two judges, particularly having lawyers' minds, the way that we would build up step by step by step a complete picture of what had actually happened. And it was, as I understand it from the legal staff, working very carefully to a strategy that would have placed the principal decision-makers on the stand on the last few days of the inquiry uh, and uh, confronted them with the evidence that had been accumulated over a considerable period of time and then asked them to explain the decisions, the evidence and their part in it. What was the most worrisome thing about the whole 
cover-up of, of information systematically during the Somalia operation um, was the fact that that people felt that this is what they were supposed to do and that they would be rewarded for doing that that the uh, their job was in fact to cover up information it wasn't wasn't to give information out to the public but it was to manipulate and cover up information and there was there were indications that 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 people who had been brought in from other departments into the national defense headquarters to work in the information side were brought in because they had achieved a reputation for effectively covering up information from the media the testimony of General Jean Boyle, the leader responsible for misleading or missing documents, proved that the lies came from the top, from inside the department itself. I see, for example, that uh, the 4th of March was, uh, was a critical uh, date because there was a shooting incident, and I see uh, late at night, and I see that on the 5th of March, the following day, uh, two pages are missing. And I am at... Uh, uh, page... Uh, yes, sir, I have that. Okay. And then the 16th of March and the 17th of March were also critical dates where incidents, major incidents occurred. And I see that there again, uh, I see page uh, 427 and 435 are missing. And then on the 19th of March, which was also a critical date, I can see that page 438 is missing. My understanding, sir, is if the critical dates are in brackets, it means that we have that. Therefore, the 16th and 17th of March, we would have those dates and those logs. The chase after the documentation started to occupy more and more time because it appeared that the, the effort to uh, destroy documentation went up very, very high in the system, and in fact, went right up to the very top, as it turned out. But the chairman's point, I thought, sir, was that we're missing the 18th of March, the day immediately following that. Similarly, the 5th of March, yeah. the day immediately following the 4th of March. That is correct. And in some cases, the dates are uh, tally exactly. Uh, the critical date is the 4th of March. The dates that are missing in that case are the 3rd and 4th of March. The critical dates further down the month is the 19th of March. The date that is missing is the 19th of March. So there are many instances where the dates tally exactly. Yes, sir. There was no doubt. I mean, uh, when the top man in the whole military uh, pyramid uh, steps down and is destroyed, basically, because of his testimony before an inquiry, that's a major event. That's a major event. I think that it is a national disgrace that the work of the commission was halted just when it got to Ottawa, just when it was about to begin to examine the events inside National Defense Headquarters.